It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Quick heads up before we get into this interview. My next guest and I talk a little bit about sexual assault, about violence and miscarriage and some other uncomfortable topics and how they fit into the world of comedy today. And there's a little bit of graphic language as well. This nothing super explicit, but if you or somebody that you're listening to this with might be sensitive to any of those things, we just we just wanted to let you know. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. It's Bullseye. My guest, Jenna Friedman. She's a comic, a writer, and a producer. She got her start writing for David Letterman. Then she moved on to The Daily Show, where she was a field producer, producing some of the show's best pieces with correspondents like Samantha Bee and Al Madrigal. These days, Jenna hosts this show on Adult Swim. It's called Soft Focus. It's kind of a periodic special that she does. As on The Daily Show, she produces these segments that take on the news of the day with a satirical edge. But Jenna is now in front of the camera, and the segments sometimes get very, very uncomfortable. She interviews an eccentric millionaire surrounded by his armed guards. She talks with an ex-cop who was caught plotting to kidnap and eat his wife. She submits male gamers to a VR simulation of unwanted sexual contact. It's all kind of stomach-churning. Jenna constantly pushes boundaries in her work. It's political, but also deadpan and a little abrasive. Friedman has a talent in finding the darkest flaws in our world and talking about them in a way that cuts very deep. It's unsettling, but also hilarious. She does stand up to, here's a little bit from a performance she did on Conan. Lately, I've developed a very rational fear of men based on how you portray yourselves in person. Um, Like if I'm walking down the street and I see a group of businessmen, I don't know what the term is, like a fraud. Um, If I just, if I see a scam of men in suits coming towards me, I'll find that I'll just instinctively clutch my purse and be like, don't grope me, you know? Don't grope me, I'm awake. Uh, A lot of my, a lot of my male friends are really nervous in this whole Me Too moment, so they're asking me for advice. And I tell them, if you're around a woman and she makes you feel nervous, just picture her clothes. <laughs> Think of her as your daughter, or better yet, a person. Jenna Friedman, welcome to Bullseye. It's nice to have you on the show. Hi. It's nice to be here. <laughs> it's just weird listening to your stand up in a soundproof room with one other person. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were a field producer on The Daily Show for a few years. Can you tell me what that job involves? Well, we were writing and directing segments uh, for the show. So any any segment with a correspondent in the field had a field producer. Um like news shows, which kind of the field producer is a person who's with the correspondent in the field. But I think with our show, because it was uh, fake news or <laughs> not fake news, but just not pure news, it had kind of editorialized elements. That role was more of like a writer director. Yeah. So I, I had a I had a buddy who was a field correspondent for The Daily Show, Al Madrigal. And I went and visited him at the Daily Show office one time, and was talking to him about his job. And Al is a very talented comedy writer, and as well as a talented comedy performer. He's like, you know, when I do field pieces, um, it's really, it's really the producer's project. I am, I am a vehicle for that writer producer. That's a person who works on this for weeks or a month. I am a person who flies to Florida for two days. Yeah, I'm glad he said that. That's the hardest job in comedy, that that job, because you're basically a filmmaker, but your actors are unwilling participants, <laughs> except for the correspondent. Um, everyone else in the segment are, are not necessarily wanting to be portrayed the way that you are going to portray them. 
Uh, again, we, we don't take people out of context, though. There is an element of journalistic integrity, at least when I was doing the field pieces. And you just shoot a bunch of stuff, and then you put a piece together. I mean, it was really, really hard, but it, it was like a crash course in film school for me. What do you feel like the goal of those pieces was? I mean, I think uh, I I always like to sugarcoat, like if I want people to understand nuances of some issue, uh, I'll give you an example. One of the pieces we did was the fast food worker strikes, where nothing about that is funny. But I really personally believe that people should have living wages. So it was a story I wanted to cover. And if you can use comedy to to show um, that type of a story in a new light, you can hook people into it. Um, that particular piece I did, Samantha B was a correspondent. It's hard to kind of joke or talk about free market economics and how it has failed. And so, um, and also to talk to really vulnerable people who are, who are fighting for living wages. Um, so for that particular piece, we actually found a, a person who um, has a I think it was like a hedge fund that was like a $70 million company. And he came on the show to talk to us about why, uh, mar- how markets determine wages and how living wages would mess up all sorts of things. And you're probably going to edit or censor what I'm, what I'm about to say. But um, <laughs> one of the questions we asked him, do you believe that markets determine wages? And he said, yes, supply and demand, markets dictate wages. So then the second question Sam asked, describe to me the type of person worth $2 an hour. And he said verbatim, I don't know the PC word for retarded. And right away, that was two minutes into him sitting down, I was like, we have a segment. Because what this is showing is that the people who believe this have very little empathy (laughs) for people working. And that's actually, in my mind, the most distilled version of that argument that if you were talking about it on a news show, you couldn't really say that because it's like too editorialized. But if we can show it coming out of the mouth of somebody who who is like a free market, unfettered, you know, capitalist, then it proves a point in a way that it's like it's using humor, but humor is not necessarily the right word in that situation. But it's like getting to the core of that argument. I think that the having watched Soft Focus, you're too... Uh, specials for Adult Swim, there is a distinct similarity in structure. You're doing a similar thing to a Daily Show field piece, generally speaking. The tone is different. And I wonder if, if first of all, if you agree with that, and second of all, if you if you could kind of describe what you wanted to be different about what you were doing on Adult Swim. Well, I mean, that's my show. I I don't have... Adult Swim's been really, really cool about not really having a heavy hand in the editorial of it. And I think because it's more under the radar, I can take, at the moment, more risks than uh, The Daily Show would take. Also, um, you know, I'm thankful that people, enough people have seen The Daily Show that the format is, like, familiar enough that people trust what we're doing without... um, being hypercritical or anything, if that makes sense. Like, it's a recognizable format, but then it, like, goes off the rails. Um, And we are in different times. Like, The Daily Show ended pre-Trump. And in that time period, we had this kind of shared reality that even if people disagreed, you felt like you were on the same ground. Whereas now, everything's so insane. It's It's just a different time without getting into specifics. And it feels like... If you watch the news and you see what's going on, you feel insane. So I think that the show is partly a response to that. It's it's a little bit, for lack of a better word, and a little bit pushing the envelope more because I feel like right now we kind of have to. I mean, it. I found it discomforting Great. in a way that I had not seen. <laughs> I mean, like I I think probably if I think back to what else I've watched on television that had that level of intensity in the comedy. Like, the only thing that came to mind was a show called Wonder Shows. I love Wonder Shows, and I always, yeah. Yeah, that's very, (laughs) very deeply distressing satirical show that, I don't know, the the, like the most vibrant memory for me is a a little boy doing a, a field piece, like a kid's journalism field piece, at a racetrack and talking to this sweet old man. And at one point he says, here's my impression of you. Gamble, 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 die. (laughs) 
I love that. Like the kids, the beat kids, kids on the street. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm not out to make people feel comfortable. <laughs> I don't know. For better or for worse, it's not my M.O. <laughs> Did you have a meeting with the staff of your show where you said or someone said, maybe we should talk to Gil, the cannibal cop? And someone else was like, yes, I think that's a good idea. And someone else was like, yes, I think that's a no, I think that's a bad idea. Like, Gil's fine. We talked to Gil on home turf. It was at our studio. We made sure that when we sent him home, he was like kept far away from the women. I think Gil's also fine now. Like he follows me on Twitter, but he also is like a horror writer. He has like a creative outlet now. I don't think he's going to eat any women going forward because he has, you know, found a a niche, niche, I don't know. Let's play a clip from my guest, Jenna Friedman, and her show, Soft Focus. Um, we talked a little bit about the cannibal cop, Gil Valley, who, who sent many emails and message board postings about eating his wife and her friends. <laughs> it's so funny. It's sad, but no one got hurt, so it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also wrote a, a book about it, and he says that uh, everything was just him indulging in very specific and complicated fantasies. And, and this is my guest, Jenna Friedman, interviewing him about it. Um, I'm not this lunatic. I'm not this homicidal maniac. You know, mm -hmm. I'm actually a very normal, nice guy. I very like go boring, with the flow. Basic. Well, uh, I wouldn't say boring, oh, but I'm just sorry. no, just just a humble and humble, yeah. kind of just random, sure. and basic guy. Yes. You're plotting to eat women on a website for fun. Mm -hmm. Your wife had suspicions. She put spyware on the computer. Mm -hmm. Caught you. Calls the FBI. They arrest you. You go to jail. What advice would you give someone who was busted by their wife for plotting to eat her and her friends on a dark fetish website? I don't know how many people have actually been in that situation. That was fun. That was one of the funniest. Because, I don't know, just normalizing it in a way that made it boring was so funny to me. And he didn't like to be called boring. That was what was so funny. I mean... That poor, well, I don't want to say that poor guy, but the media had such, made such a meal out of his <laughs> where at the same time, his wife left him. Like, I joke with my boyfriend that if, like, I found out that he was plotting to eat me, I'd be like, Josh, <laughs> like, I know him, you know, and I know, I know what he's capable of, and I'm pretty sure he wouldn't eat me. But, like, if, if you think your partner is going to eat you, there's, like, something to that that feels real. And somewhere else I read that we didn't include in the interview, he would, like, ask her what her running routes were and stuff. Like, it was just very weird. Um, but it also was really fun to show a side of someone that the media hasn't, which is that he was, like, this, like, University of Maryland guy, kind of normal, decided to just, like, become a cop, you know. And I think our culture is so obsessed with serial killers, and it's just— even though, I, like, it feels boring at this point. They're not masterminds. They're just kind of, like, basic dudes. And I think if we if we stopped being obsessed and glamorizing men who kill women, maybe they would do it less so. I think the funniest thing in that clip, I mean, the, the laugh is you transitioning from the description of what a normal guy he is to the specifics of his incredibly not normal behavior. But the thing that I enjoyed the most in that is you just maintaining his tone and stretching out as long as you possibly could the interchange of you and he exchanging descriptors of how boring he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were really careful when we produced that with the women because the second part is a dating game. And I... At the last minute, we were like, what if we got a woman on the on the game who would actually date him? As opposed to have it just be like a joke about him being creepy. Like, why don't let's go on a fetish website. This is just a window into production. And find a woman who's like into blood play or whatever. And we did. 
And like the result, so that dating game was completely unscripted. He had no idea that was going to happen beforehand. The way that that segment, the way that we pulled it off, and it was a whole team of really smart people I was working with. To this day, I'm like amazed by what we were able to capture um, in that dating game. Having the only thing we scripted were, you know, questions for everybody. There were questions we had him ask the women that I, I couldn't. I break very rarely. Breaking is laughing. And there was this one moment when he was asking the women, like, how fast do you run? That if you, like, listen really carefully, I'm, I'm, I'm uncontrollably quietly giggling because it was the most uncomfortable, hilarious thing I've ever been part of. We'll finish up my conversation with Jenna Friedman after a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about why women still have a hard time breaking into the world of stand-up comedy. It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. In 1980, with a few thousand dollars and used dairy equipment, Ken Grossman founded Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Ken's award-winning ales propelled him from home brewer to craft brewer. Today, Ken and his family still own 100% of the company, one of the most successful independent craft breweries in America. More at sierranevada.com. This season on Invisibilia, should we empathize with our enemies? Femoids should f***ing die. Is it okay to have machines control our emotions? I should be kind of creeped out, but at the same time, I'm like, well, thank God I live in this day and age. No easy answers, just the right questions. Invisibilia, back on March 8th. Welcome back, and thank you, Dan, for that scathing report. As you know, Max Fun Drive is coming up March 18th to March 29th, which has some folks pretty excited. But as families around the world get ready to celebrate this season of giving, community, and quality podcasts, some are wondering if it's just too much. Are they, though? They are. Some people are all for comedy and culture, but with 45 shows offering hundreds of hours of bonus content, plus all the Max Fun meetups taking place around the world, some people think it's too much. While other people think it sounds totally awesome. I took my granddaughter to the mall to get her picture taken, and the mall pod fairy was short. And I, you know, I'm just gonna say it, I'm sorry, but everyone knows the pod fairy is tall. Well, I think we should just leave it there. <laughs> Until next time, here's the news you need to know. Max Fun Drive runs from March 18th through 29th. Be sure to listen to all of your favorite podcasts. I know I will. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is Jenna Friedman. She's the host and creator of the Adult Swim special series, Soft Focus. She's also a comic and writer who's written for The Daily Show and The Late Show with David Letterman. A warning before we get back into this segment, Jenna and I talk about sexual assault and miscarriage and a few other sensitive things, and things are a little graphic. If you're sensitive to that kind of thing, we just wanted to give you a heads up. Anyway, back to my conversation with Jenna Friedman. You pretty much open your show with a segment about rape. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Why did you decide Why? to... <laughs> Well, I mean, like, as I, because I, it happens all the time. I mean, I was in college and I could count on the my fingers and toes the amount of women I knew that passed out at a frat party and woke up with a dick inside them. Like, the, it, it was so bad when I was in college. And I remember the whole controversy with the Rolling Stone article on, on UVA and how that was handled and botched. And it, it was so heartbreaking because I... It, it's such a real thing that I know not just from secondhand experience um, how uh, how much of uh, an epidemic that is that I felt like at that moment we lost this opportunity to really talk about it. And it's not, you know, there are serial offenders who just get away with it on college campuses. That's the most that is the most of people who commit uh, date rape. But it's also people who just haven't ever thought about consent and don't think of it as as rape. And and I think just getting people to think about consent and using comedy to do that, it's not going to stop everybody. But to a guy who takes a girl home who's really, really wasted or a girl who takes advantage of a guy who's really, really wasted, maybe if they're thinking about 
what affirmative consent means, they'll a- act differently. I think when I do jokes, and I'm not a stand-up comic, but I perform comedy <laughs> in front of audiences, I have found myself over the last 10 years and have been grateful to have done um, reevaluating the way that I think about sexual assault in humor. Rape jokes. Rape jokes. And one of the reasons I think is that as a dude, it took people kind of looking me in the eye and explaining to me that when I'm sitting in a room with 200 people in them and some proportion like one or two in five uh, have been uh, of the women in that room have been sexually assaulted that it, it no matter who is the you know target of my joke no matter what the structure of my joke is and oh the joke is about this it's not about this or whatever like i'm joking about probably uh, like the one of the biggest traumas in the lives of 20 percent of the people sitting in that room and that was something that I had to really think about a lot. And I imagine that it's also something that you have thought about a lot before you waded into doing any kind of humor about that. So there are actually like two issues here. One is is talking about a subject, even if you're talking about it from the right side of it with humanity, and having that trigger men and women who have been victims of harassment or assault. I am not someone who says that you should shy away from talking about whatever because you might trigger somebody in the audience. I want to believe that women are not porcelain dolls and that people who go to comedy shows, um, they have to be responsible for how they're going to react to a subject matter that a comedian talks about. For example, I have jokes. I have one particular joke about miscarriage. And part of the reason I'm talking about it is because Republicans are legislating it. We're not talking about it. It is so common and so many women experience it. But because we don't talk about it, it increases this kind of isolation and stigma when it happens to you. So I think we really need to be talking about these very real things so that men like Lindsey Graham, who've never seen a vagina, don't get to legislate them. He might have seen one at birth. I imagine his eyes were closed. Whatever. That's issue number one. Number two, though is the issue of like a man talking about rape jokes. And I think any man can talk about rape jokes or anything. You just run the risk if you're on the wrong side of it of sounding like a rapist. But I wouldn't tell you if you have a rape joke that makes fun of rapists, don't shy away from that because we need people talking about these things. And if somebody says, hey, you can't talk about rape, that's messed up because men get raped too. And these are real things. And again, I think... We should be talking about everything and talking about it with honesty and kindness and and humanity and not being afraid when people who maybe aren't listening to you misinterpret what you're saying. Just be able to kind of nothing is less funny than explaining a joke. But if people need you to explain a joke to to not just I mean, people are going to jump on you no matter what. But I think you shouldn't shy away from rape jokes if you're telling them from a a side that is (laughs) anti-rape. Yeah, I mean, I I have a, I don't have um, firsthand experience with sexual assault, but um, I have firsthand experience in in my family with uh, post traumatic stress, and the thing that I thought about, and ultimately, for me, I decided I'm like I'm gonna really do my best not to talk about that in a humor situation. It was thinking about the ways that, like, you know, Fleet Week. My my fa- my dad is a veteran who suffers from severe post traumatic stress disorder, and just thinking about the way that Fleet Week affects him, like Fleet Week, the most innocuous thing on earth. Like, I even even a pacifist uh, loves the Blue Angels. It's really fun. <laughs> like, it's cool to see airplanes do tricks. But thinking about the ways that that affected him in my life when I was a kid, you know, the way that I saw it, I thought, you know, I don't think that I don't think that I'm going to do a good enough job of contextualizing whatever I'm going to do to take care of the people in the audience who suffered a really major trauma. You know what I mean? And that's not to say that no one ever should or anything, but just it's it's hard to um, 
it, you, you take on a big task doing that responsibly. I mean, we put a trigger warning on the front of our episode because of the sexual content of particularly the first segment. But at the same time, it's like you're doing a disservice to people if you're protecting them. You know, I'm, I don't want to helicopter parent my audience. I had a woman after a show come up to me crying after a miscarriage joke. I was doing a show at the Comedy Cellar, and she wasn't criticizing the joke. She just, like, she's like, you know, I work in, like, obstetrics, and I, she just cried. And then I'm sitting next to Michelle Wolf, who was like, don't put your baggage on me. Like, she's way tougher than I am. Um, <laughs> like, uh, but I think, you know, you don't want people to feel bad. But at the same time, like, it's not my job to my job I mean some comics job is to make people laugh and feel good that's not why I do what I do I like people to think I like people to feel challenged I like people to kind of learn and hopefully modify their behavior if their behavior is damaging I feel like in comedy there is there are unique vulnerabilities for women um, that's not to say that vulnerability in general is unique to comedy, but there are unique vulnerabilities. Um, you know, everyone is an independent contractor. Um, there's no HR. There's no HR. There are many more men than women. Actually, there are many more men that you see than women, but when they start out, there are a lot of women in the like beginning rungs of comedy and for many reasons they don't continue or they try to continue and they don't get the same opportunities but it is a myth that there are like like if you see a show at a club and it has nine men and one woman that is not in any way representative of the amount of women trying to at least work in comedy you know once i tweeted at i i had a, a an acquaintance who i followed on twitter who was a regular at one of the big comedy clubs here in Los Angeles and would retweet the lineups when he was on them. And, you know, they, they book great comics. You know, these are, this is Los Angeles where you move to work in show business. You're talking business about the comedy and, store, yeah. <laughs> and I would look at the lineups and I'd be like, this is, this is a 14-person lineup with one woman or yeah, two that, women Yeah, that is the it. comedy store. And it's hard for us to call this stuff out because we want to get booked there. But, yeah, clubs... Many clubs, especially in New York and L.A., do not show lineups that reflect the uh, gender composition of, of people working in the industry. I tweeted, I, I tweeted at them. I might have retweeted, I might have quote tweeted them, but I tweeted at them like, that's 14 comics and two women. Like, you can do better than that. And I am not joking. They tweeted at me a picture of a flyer for like ladies night it's like separate but equal yeah and i was like do you think that's a suitable response yeah <laughs> like in public i just i couldn't i couldn't believe it was real this was not in 2002 this past year the new york comedy festival i had a flyer out that was like maybe all men and one woman on the festival like in one of the original like it, the initial kind of pushes uh pr pushes for the festival and yeah, I mean, you want to joke like, oh, New York Men's Comedy Festival looks great. But again, like we are uh, freelance people and we are trying to just get booked. So it's hard to be outspoken about this stuff. Well, I, I really appreciate your work. I'm, I'm grateful for what you've done. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Be kind to, to everyone, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Jenna Friedman, thank you for coming on Bullseye. It was really nice to get to talk to you. Oh, you too. Jenna Friedman. You can watch both of her soft focus specials at adultswim.com. Uh, they are really breathtaking. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is recorded at MaximumFun.org World Headquarters, overlooking MacArthur Park in beautiful Los Angeles, California. My producer Kevin just saw a car commercial shot from one of the offices in our building. It truly is a dream to live here in what we call Tinseltown. The show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien. 
Our interstitial music is by DJ W, a.k.a. Dan Wally. Thanks for sharing it with us, Dan. Our theme song is called Huddle Formation. It's by the band The Go Team. They and their label Memphis Industries provided it to us. Our thanks to them. And before you go, we have 15 years of this show. Going back to the days when it was called The Sound of Young America, literally hundreds of interviews. They're almost all archived. You can find them all on our website at MaximumFun.org. Uh, you can also find many of them on our YouTube channel, especially the recent ones. We put we put them each up as, as we make them. They're easy to share and listen to there. Um, you can also find us on Facebook and on Twitter. You can just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. We're at Bullseye on Twitter. That's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.